Appreciate your singing tonight. Appreciate the prayer that's been offered. Lord willing, I'd like to return to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. I'd like to pick up where we left off down around verse number 9. But just to touch a review, um, since it's been a while since we have studied, um, it's good for us just to be reminded where we have been tonight. And when we do pick it up in verse number 9, the Apostle Paul spends a good bit of time talking about loving one another, loving one another, and how important it is. And he even sets up a criteria for that love. But just uh, just a bit of review in uh, chapter 13. The Apostle Paul instructs the children of God to obey civil authorities. You know, the government should have nothing to fear from the church of Jesus Christ. We ought to be good and faithful uh, uh, citizens of our country. We ought to be hardworking citizens of our country. We ought to apply ourselves to, uh, to, the, uh, to the service of our Lord. We ought to be kind and gracious to, uh, to government officials as well as to citizens around us. And in verse number 2, 13 and 2, uh, he makes the point that we are to obey civil authority and to disobey civil authority is to disobey God because God has commanded us to obey civil authority. Now, when we talked about this in its context, we dealt with it, uh, there are limitations to it. If civil authorities begin to try to dictate to us church behavior and doctrine, um, the biblical pattern is that 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 doesn't fit in this category. We don't obey that. We obey God over civil authority in such matters as that. But in, uh, in matters of civil behavior, we obey the authorities over us. And then he makes the point in verses 3 and 4 that civil authorities are not a terror to uh, faithful children of God, but they are to evil doers. And by the way, uh, Paul also makes the point that there is no powers but what is ordained of God. That God uh, has uh, a reserve to himself to control all authorities and powers. Okay? Then in uh, uh, verse 13 and 5, um, obeying civil authorities, we're to do that for conscience' sake. The word conscience has to do with um, the knowledge that God gives us of him and of his word and the love of God and those kind of things. And so our behavior in the service of God is dictated by our spiritual conscience, the love that God has given to us. And so we do it because we love. Jesus Christ said it this way, John fourteen fifteen. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is, considering that you love me, you obey me to demonstrate to me that you love me. Then in uh, verses 6 and 7, we're to support uh, the civil authorities, which in- includes paying taxes and various tributes and those kind of things, that we ought to do that without hesitation. Then in verse number 8, he tells us to owe no man anything, which means pay your debts. If you have a debt, pay it. And I remember from my childhood uh, that uh, most often contracts were sealed with a handshake. There was nothing written down. If one person said that I will do this or I'll pay you that, it was done. I mean, it was it was as good as uh, as a legal contract. I mean, you, you could counter it. Somebody told you something, you could counter it. And I remember folks saying that um, if, if you can't count on a person's word, you can count on them for nothing. Okay. So then we get down, so we're talking about our civil behavior. Get down to verse number 9. And let's read uh, the first, um, well, let's just read to the end of the chapter. And then we'll come back and pick it up. He says, for this, and we'll come to this in a moment, what he's talking about. For this, uh, thou shalt uh, not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly con- comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. 
And that knowing the time, and that it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and in chambering and in wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put on, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, we will not get to all of that tonight, but let's go back to verse number 9. For this. In verse number 8, he says, O no man anything, but love one another, for he that loveth an, uh, another fulfilleth the law. For this. Fulfilleth the law. To love is to fulfill the law. For this. Then what follows, he connects the two, love and what follows, is five of the Ten Commandments. Almost verbatim. The Ten Commandments are recorded in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let's go back. Let's pick one of those. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 and look there just briefly. I'm going to point out some things to you about that. And uh, um, uh, some folks, uh, you know, like to recite the Ten Commandments, but just don't pay much attention to what they say. And they, they it's almost as if uh, they're doing it just for historical sake, but not to apply it to themselves. Now, the first, ten, uh, first of the Ten Commandments, the first four of them in particular, have to do with the worship of God. For the first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I mean, I, God said, I'm the only one. I'm the only God. There is no other God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And then he... Uh, expounds upon that. So um, we worship only God. And there's no other gods and no image. We don't worship any image either. And then the other one in verse number 7, he says, Thou shalt not uh, take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That, that one is often uh, misapplied. And to say that you don't use profanity in the name of God in the same phrase. Well, that's true. We should not. We should use profanity to start with, but that's not what that's talking about. You have a name, and I've, I've tried to preach on that a number of times. You have a name that God gave you. You're His children. You're the child of the Most High God. You're named after Him in the in a spiritual sense, and we're to take that name with the ultimate respect. Your heavenly Father and your elder brother, Jesus Christ, have given you a name. And we're to treat that name with great respect. My dad told us boys many times. He says, boys, I've tried to give you a good name. You treat that name with respect. I've tried to treat the name with respect. And my dad was an honored man. Um, his word uh, was, uh, was relied upon and trusted. He says, you, 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 um, you treat your name well. And so this is what this pastor said. You're, you're named of your heavenly Father. He's given you a name. You're the child of God. And then he said, just, uh, notice how he says that. He says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That means the name that he's given you as his child, you're not to treat it as it doesn't mean anything. You're to treat it with utmost value. And you're to live honorably to glorify his name with great respect to his name. And then, in verse number uh, 8, he's, it's the fourth one. He says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's the day that God has set aside for his church to come together and worship him. I mean, that's... That's a commandment. That's not a suggestion. That is God's commandment that His children come together on the Lord's day and worship Him. He's established it that way. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then 
Here's one that sort of fit, uh, set in the middle, verse number 12. He says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and thy mother. That is something that it ought to be taught to children and reminded them of over and over again. That is, has specifically to do with a family, with a proper order and structure of a family, and the respect for the family. And that, other than the church, is the basic uh, uh, root of all civil life. When the family goes upside down, social order goes upside down. Corruption, ungodliness, immoralness, uh, greed, um, uh, wickedness comes about when the family goes upside down. Then the other commandments, the other five, has to do with the social order discipline and caring about others and uh, living a godly life. Thou shalt not kill. He, he puts them in priority order. Thou shalt not kill. Now that kill doesn't mean uh, that, uh, um, that we, can't, we don't have a judicial system that could exercise capital punishment because God established that early in Genesis. Uh, and he's not talking about an, a military or a, a, a law service as well. He's talking about getting mad with somebody and going and just summarily taking their life because you're angry with them, or going robbing somebody to take what they have and murdering them in the process. That's killing. He says, thou shalt not kill. He says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now that is if, uh, if a person is married to someone other than they're having an intimate relationship with, that is adultery. And that is the commandment from God. And remember when David did that, King David did that, he paid an awful price for that. Then he says, thou shalt not steal. That's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory. Thou shalt not steal. Then he says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Don't tell lies. Don't make up stuff. Don't tell uh, fibs. Don't tell things that would uh, put somebody else in, um, in a bad light. Just don't do that. This is a commandment from God. Then he says, verse number 17, thou shalt not covet. Um, and I work very hard at that. I, I, I spend a lot of time working. There are certain things that I really uh, would like that um, I try not to, to covet. But, but we're all guilty of those in varying degrees. Now, so let's go back to Romans chapter uh, 13 and verse number 9. Now here the Apostle Paul is talking about our social order. How we get along in society. How we get along amongst ourselves in the church. And if there's ever um, uh, a place when these commandments ought to be applied, it's in the church of Jesus Christ. So he says, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, the reason that Paul is, is, is writing this is because people were known to do these things. And in the, the, the Greek and Roman culture, this was okay. I mean, it was part of society. They just, it was just, it just, it was accepted. And in, in their pagan religion, it was, uh, it was actually part of, uh, of many of their religious practices. But he says, for this thou shalt not commit adultery. Then he says, thou shalt not kill. And it's like, like in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. For if there be any, and if there be any other commandment, it is uh, briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The point of that is, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against him. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to covet what your neighbor has. If your neighbor has something grand and wonderful, like a new hot water heater, you're going to be proud for them. You're going to be thankful for them. You're going to rejoice with them uh, in the things that they have. Now, loving your neighbor... Is not a new thing. And I gave you the passage there, and you could look it up, in, but I, I printed it out for you to make it easy. In Leviticus chapter 9, and verse number 18, um, there's a distinction here that Paul takes. He takes Old Testament teaching, and he goes a bit farther. He tells us to love our neighbor, and then he goes on to tell us, as the Lord has loved us, which is 
uh, goes a step farther than the Old Testament teaching did. Leviticus 19 and 18, Moses records it. He says, Thou shalt not um, avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That means, uh, you know, um, I don't... We, I don't, he's not saying that we love ourselves in a vain way, but I guarantee you, I love myself enough that I'm not going to do it, and I'm not knowing they're going to do harm to myself. I'm just, I'm not going to go out and hurt myself on purpose. I just, I'm, I'm just, I have an aversion to doing that. I, I don't like to hurt, and um, I don't like to be disadvantaged, so I'm not going to disadvantage myself in any way knowingly. And so he says, if you wouldn't do that to yourself, then you don't do it to your neighbor either. You treat your neighbor in the same way that you would treat yourself. And then he says, God punctuates that. He says, I, I told you this, and I am the Lord. This is from the Lord, a message from God. And then in, uh, in verse 34 of uh, Leviticus 19, he says this, But the stranger that dwelleth with thee, uh, uh, with you, shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Not only, not only are we to treat our own folks, but if somebody comes among us, we're to love them and encourage them and speak well of them as well as we do each other. We're to express love to them. And he said, notice again, he says, as thyself. Now, we're going to come to some, uh, to some specific instruction on that in just a moment. Now, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, um, we must remember that God, the love of God is first. That's number one above everything. Jesus said unto him, this man that he speaketh to, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with, notice now, all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. You know, heart, soul, and mind. That means our whole being. We're to love God. We're committed to Him. You know, it's one thing to have that, that tender feeling in our heart toward God. Every born-again child of God has that. But then he's telling us is you take that and you put it into action with the things that you think and the things that you say and the things that you do. Your whole life is to be committed to the love of God, showing your love of God by your obedience to Him. All children of God don't do that, ask David, ask Solomon, ask Lot. Um, but when God gives us spiritual birth, we have that love in our heart, and then we're to put that love into action. Uh, I learned, I, I'm, 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 I'll be 69 this month, and I am still learning patience. I'm still working on it. You know, uh, I, I would greatly desire, and I pray that every child of God that has the love of God in their heart would live it. I cannot imagine not living it, not wanting it. I, um, I want to go to church. As a matter of fact, if y'all decide to have church every day, I would rejoice and be here with you. Because I love to come together with you. I love to think about the things of God. I love to hear the songs sung in the praise of God. I love to hear the prayers that are offered. I love to see your faces. I love the experience of God in church. And I can't imagine not doing that. And then those who obviously love the Lord, you, you'd think, my goodness, you just need to show it a little better. You know, there was an old analogy that I heard of from, from my childhood back in the days when folks had fireplaces and those kind of things. There was this brother that had just slowly put attending church, and he just um, got to where he wouldn't come very often, and then it was longer and longer between the times he'd go to church, and, and after a while he just didn't show up anymore. And finally one day on a very cold winter day, the pastor went by there to see him. Y'all may have heard this. It's been quite widely told. The pastor went by to see him, and the old fellow welcomed him in. We, he was sitting there by the fireplace, and so went in, and, and they sat down by the fireplace, and the pastor didn't say much, and the brother didn't say much. So the pastor just took the tongs by the fireplace and reached in there and got one of the red-hot coals. And he took that 
red hot coal and he moved it out and dropped it on the hearth. And they just sat there and watched and that, that red hot coal soon they just turned dark and black. The pastor waited a little bit and then took the tongs again in his hand and reached out and got the, that dark coal, coal and put it back in the fire and just a minute it was red hot like the others. The pastor got up Shook hands with the brother, and the brother says, I'll see you in church Sunday. <laughs> he got the message. And that's the way we are. If we start slipping and quit going to church, then after a while it just gets easier and easier not to go to church. Uh, and and um, I, I, my, I, my prayer is that, that the children of God will just love the Lord, not only in their heart, but in action and in deed. Well, so he says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He says, This is the first and great commandment. He says, That's the top commandment of all. He says, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The Lord comes first, and then the neighbor. Now, would you turn back with me to Luke chapter 10? Luke chapter 20, 10, verse number 25. Now, I know that you're familiar with this, um, this parable that the Lord uses to make his point. But I find that it's often beneficial for us to review the Psalms and the parables so that we, we would be refreshed in our thinking and our understanding. Verse number 25, Luke 10 to 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, the Lord, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, that's a question that's often asked today. But I want you to notice how the Lord answers that. Notice, he, the question was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, the Lord, said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Well, he answered, and he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said, the Lord said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt what? Live. He didn't say you'd have eternal life. He says you're going to live. That word live has the connotation of a good life. It means you're going to have a pleasing life. You're going to have a joyful life. He said, you want to be happy? You want to think good thoughts? And do? He says, you do that, and you'll have a good life. Then this man that he was talking to, he says, but he willing to justify himself. You know, we always want to know, well, okay, how far can we push this envelope? You know, just, just, just how much of this actually applies to me. But he willing to justify himself, said it to Jesus. He says, and who is my neighbor? Now, just who do I have to love anyway? Just how many folks do I have to love? Just, just what kinds of people do I have? Can I categorize people? Because there's some that I don't have to love. That's what he was really getting to. Do I really have to love everybody? Or is there some? So uh, this was a Jewish fellow that was talking to the Lord and trying to lay this snare before him. So the Lord tells, gives him this parable. And a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, Given that he was leaving Jericho, uh, Jerusalem and going to Jericho, he was probably a Jewish man. So he left uh, Jerusalem and went down to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. Now, that trip from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, as I understand, in that day was through a very steep gorge. It was, heavy, it was a, a very mountainous and a very rugged area. And we've been there. They call it the Valley of the Shadow of Death because the... Um, the gorge, uh, the valley is so steep on both sides uh, that you, you, you couldn't hardly climb up and down it. So what they had done over the years, they cut a little, uh, a little pathway along the side of one of the uh, slopes. And it was, it was a very narrow path where you couldn't hardly, two people couldn't hardly pass. And so a thieves would wait uh, um, as it curved around the sides of the mountain. The thieves would wait around there. And when somebody came around there, they'd jump him. And, and the fellow had, he just didn't have much choice to either tangle with the thieves or jump over the cliff. And so that was, it was a perilous place. So he says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. 
which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and, de and departed, leaving him half dead. Half dead means he would probably have died if somebody had not helped him. He was in bad shape. They took everything he had. So he must have looked in bad shape. The man was stripped and had been badly beaten, so uh, badly beaten that he was near death. So he must have looked a mess. If you've ever seen anybody in that condition, um, it's not somebody you would want to walk up and put your hands on. If you ever see somebody, if you've ever seen anybody, you, you know, you, you have to condition yourself to, to go help them, to put your hands on them to help them. Uh, because that is, naturally, we're, we're offended by that. Naturally, we have an aversion to putting our hands on someone that's in that condition. Folks who are going to the medical profession have to be specifically trained uh, to be able to go in there and handle uh, situations like that. And so, uh, there's an aversion to do that. So, just keep that in mind. He says, uh, and they had stripped uh, him of his raiment, and had wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by, I like, I like the wording. Um, you know, anybody that says the Bible doesn't teach, chance hasn't read this. Now watch this. And by chance there came down a certain priest. Now, priest, he was of the order of Aaron, the first high priest. He was of the lineage of Aaron. Now, and so he was a priest, having all the authority, the uh, position, the prestige. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. I mean, there wasn't much other side there. That little path wasn't that large. And so the point was he walked as far away around him as he possibly could because he didn't want to sully himself. He didn't want to soil his hands probably. All right. So the priest passed by. And likewise, a Levite, which is, you know, Aaron was a Levite, but all the Levites weren't priests, but he was a Levite. He had charge and leadership responsibilities around the, uh, the temple. So he had a position of authority. So the Levite, when he was uh, at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. He looked down. And, and my guess is he looked around to see if anybody saw him passing and just walked right on by, by him and didn't help the poor fellow. Now, the Jews hated the Samaritans. They would never like to be compared to a Samaritan in any circumstance. I mean, there, there was great animus between the Samaritans and the Jews. But after the priest passed by, the Levite passed by, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had what? Compassion on him. I mean, this man that the Jews hated so severely, he uh, had compassion upon him and wanted to help him. Now, compassion is born out of love. And he went to him and bound up his wounds. That means he put his hands upon this bloodied man that was a bad shape. He had such compassion and love for him that he put his hands on him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, at which um, oil was to soothe, and the wine was um, uh, to kill the germs and that sort of thing, to cleanse it, poured in uh, oil and wine, and set him on his own beast. He didn't even ride himself, apparently. He put this wounded man on his own animal and led him and brought him to an inn and took care of him. He carried him in there. He, he, he got him as comfortable as possible and cared for him and provided for him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, which is two days' wages, took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, the Lord has just told this man, this Jewish man, uh, these things. And then he says in verse number 36, which now of these three, the, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? 
And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then the Lord says, uh, then uh, said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. He says, you love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anyone who is in need. My neighbor is anyone who is in distress. My neighbor is anyone that comes into my path. And um, we, we have a tendency to choose very carefully those that we show compassion to. That is our human nature. But the Lord uses the example. Now, by the way, more than likely, that Samaritan had no clue who that man was. More than likely, had never seen him before. Didn't know whether he was a crook or whether he was, he may have even been a Levite himself. Nobody knows. But the point is that the folks that these Jews thought were nobodies showed more compassion than they did. So the message to us is that we're to be compassionate, we're to be loving, and we're to love others even as we love ourselves. Now, on your outline, John 13 and 34, Jesus Christ gives his apostles, thus us, a new commandment. A new commandment. Now, up to this point, it is love thy neighbor as thyself. So in John 13, 34, the Lord, by the way, you remember John 13? What was happening in John chapter 13? They were washing one another's feet. The Lord had just administered the last valid Passover and the first Passover. And he just washed the disciples' feet and then he began to teach them. He says, a new commandment I give unto thee that ye love one another. Here's the advanced criteria. You love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So how much does Jesus Christ love you? How much does God the Father love you? God the Father loved you so much that he sent his only begotten and beloved. That means he loved his son. He sent his only begotten and beloved son to this world to die for me. How much did he love me? He sent his son to give his life, not only to die a natural death, but also to bear my sins away from me. He, to bear my sins in himself away from me. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5, I believe, um, he tells us that he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is a great love, wouldn't you say so? Paul even calls it that in Ephesians 2 and 4, a great love wherewith he hath loved us. And so this is a new commandment, that as the Lord has loved us, and you know, Jesus Christ loved the unlovable. You know, he even loved the loved Saul of Tarsus, even before he was born again. Did you know that he loved you even when you were in a wicked state? Turn back with, with Romans chapter 5. I've got it printed out there for you. But just turn back. Let's put your eyes on it in your Bible. Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul loved us when we were in a most ungodly state. Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul tells us very candidly in verse number 6. Pick it up there. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in, in due time Christ died for the what? ungodly. That means, I mean, we, we didn't have any righteousness about us at all. No goodness about it. He died for the ungodly. And then in verse number 8, but God commendeth his what? Love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So how much did Jesus Christ love us? If we're to love one another as Christ has loved us, then that's a tall order, isn't it? Okay. And then he says, in verse number 10, he says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled uh, to God by the death of his Son, much more we shall be reconciled, uh, uh, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He's telling us that Jesus Christ died for us and bore our sins away from us when we were yet in our sins and enemies against him. We are to love one another as he has loved us. Do you suppose he loved his apostles? Mm -hmm. He did. 
He loved them knowing that in the hour of his greatest trial that every one of them would forsake him. He loved Peter knowing that Peter would curse and deny that he knew him. What a magnificent God we have. A gracious and a kind and a loving. And he sets the standard. Jesus Christ himself set the standard that we are to love one another as he has loved us. Now, there's another aspect to that that I didn't put in here that I want to point out. John chapter 13. Turn back there with me just briefly. John chapter 13. The Lord um, uses that to make this point. Let's read verse 34 right out of John chapter 13. A new commandment I, I give unto thee, that, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know, by this love. As you're loving each other as I have loved us, by this shall all men know that ye are my what? Disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, there's nothing more attractive than love. When you, you come in uh, upon a group of people that love one another, they're showing love to one another. A child of God with the love of God in their heart is naturally attracted to that love and drawn to it. Even, even, before, even before there's a good understanding of doctrine and practice, that love is... Matter of fact, the Lord told uh, those in the Old Testament, He says, with loving kindness have I what? Drawn thee. He says, you saw kindness from me, you felt the love from me, and that love and kindness is what drew you to me. Now, Galatians 5 and 14, I got in, in your outline, Paul says it this way. He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. You want to be a keeper of the law? You want to do everything right? He says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, this reaches the pinnacle point. And then in James 2 and 8, James says this. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. You're doing well. If you're loving each other, if we're putting others even before ourselves, if we're concerned about each other's welfare, we turn about each other's health, we're concerned about each other's feelings, and if we're doing that, we're not going to, we're not going to do anything ill against them. We're not going to say bad things about them. We're not going to say bad things to them. We're going to say good and kind and encouraging things to those in our church family, those in our family, those in our community, and the strangers that come in among us. We're going to be kind and gracious and loving to them. If we do that, then peace is going to prevail. If we do that, we're going to be a happy people. The love breeds happiness. And by the way, if we're doing that, we're going to be contented. The opposite of content is disturbance and trouble. If you're loving one another as you love yourself, then there's not going to be any contention. There's not going to be any trouble. There's not going to be any disagreements. Then he says, that then uh, uh, based upon that, and if we're loving one another, we're going to have joy in Christ Jesus our Lord among ourselves. Of course, when we come together, we're going to focus upon Jesus Christ. We don't focus upon the things of the world. You know, um, we just sort of brush back uh, politics when we have a prayer request and the things that are going on in the country because we're afraid for our leaders. But that's about the extent of it in the old Baptist church. That is about as political as we get is to pray for our leaders. So there's no contention among us. As a matter of fact, when you, when you join the church, uh, you don't have to sign a block say whether you're a Democrat or a Republic or Independent. You don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, I'd be afraid to ask them sometimes. <laughs> but, but the point is, there's peace, there's joy, there's love, there's fellowship, there's kindness and graciousness, and there's great happiness among the people that love one another in the Lord. Okay? Anybody got questions or comments?